Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin was salatu wassalamu ala asyrafil mursalin sayidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Rabbi yassir wa la tu'assir rabbi tammim bil khair. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim. Wala hawla wala quwata illa billahi al-alil azim. Wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawabur rahim. Alhamdulillah. Allah SWT has granted us health, time and most importantly the blessings of iman for us to continue our learning, to continue our pursuit of lessons that can be extracted from the glorious life of the Prophet SAW to be applied in current circumstances so that we become people who are always enlightened and always enlightening others around us. Now, last week, we shared about how the Prophet SAW dealt with different people who came to him. I want to just start off today's lesson by sharing about what the Prophet actually advised those whom he sent over to other parts of the Arabian Peninsula to do da'wah, to spread the message of Islam. One of them was a companion by the name of Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal. He was sent to Yemen. And here's one aspect of the Prophet's da'wah that he actually shared to Sayyidina Mus um, Mu'adh bin Jabal so that he could implement it. And it's a lesson for us as well in how we call people to goodness. So he says that you are going to be sent to a group of to, to, to a people, to a community who... Worship other than Allah SWT. Means that they don't worship Allah, they worship other than Allah SWT. So he says then, wish, teach them to worship Allah. Introduce them to Allah SWT. So first, the Prophet says, do that. Introduce Allah to them. And after that, teach them how to pray. And once they have started praying, then teach them about the zakat. Now, this is a very simple but a very meaningful approach that we often overlook. In our anxiety, in our desire to get people to do da'wah, to get people to do, to do good. Sometimes we, we give so much of information, involve inform, information overload, as they say today, to the point whereby it becomes confusing, sometimes it becomes very overbearing, and sometimes we don't even prioritize the weightage of that knowledge or that information that's given to a person. Like sometimes we, we focus so much on a particular aspect when it's not actually obligatory, but it's in fact recommended. Like for example, someone enters a mosque and then he doesn't have what I'm wearing here, doesn't have a headgear, but he's performing solid for the first time. And then we make it a point to actually get him to be dressed up in a way, which is good, but sometimes some people are not used to it. And therefore, it becomes something that's overbearing to them. And after a while, they become a little bit um, skeptical or they become a little bit, they, they, they become a little, they, they feel that this, that this is very challenging for them. All right? So, not trying to undermine the recommended aspects of worship, but there is a need to be gradual. So, this was the case when he told Sayyidina Mu'ad bin, um, um, Mu bin Jabal to be actually gradual. So, once they know Allah, tell them to pray. Once they started praying, Tell them about zakat. And these are two things the Prophet is emphasizing. The importance of steadfastness. All right? To be steadfast. To, to teach people to be steadfast. So that it might be a little, but then it's gradual. So this is one aspect of da'wah that we need to bear in mind. That we get people excited, enticed to do small things, but over a prolonged period of time. Because the tendency of, of men is that when they are exposed to something new and they find benefit in it, Sometimes they like to take a huge share of it. And it is something is a little bit more than they can swallow. And after a while, the Prophet ﷺ cautions against this, that religion is something that we enter into gradually, that we do not overburden ourselves with it. There were some companions who wanted to worship the whole night without sleeping, wanted to fast without breaking fast, who didn't want to get married because they felt that like these were obstructions. But the Prophet cautioned against this. Some scholars said, for example, even when we get up in the middle of the night to do our night prayers, to do our qiyamu layl, to do our tahajjud, when you do, do those prayers, if you're doing it for the first time, it's always good. Or if you're not used to doing it and you want to get started, it's always good to start off with something simple. 
two rakaats which is why Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas says that two rakaats in the middle of the night is as good as the whole night in worship. Why? To entice us, to tell us to just get things done simply. So get two done and if every night you can do two rakaat and because you don't feel, you, you feel it's light. It's two rakaat. And then you feel like you want to do it every day because it's like, but if you start off with eight, 10, 10 and long surahs, right? In the first few sessions, you might feel, well, very empowered because it's something new. But after a while, we are only human and we get tired, we get exhausted. What more in Singapore, we have a lot of things to deal with in addition to our worship. And then after a while, we find that we get very tired of it. And some scholars say the interesting part is that the prophet conscience against this because not only do you miss Qiyamulail sometimes, you even miss your Fajr. So in order to uphold something which is recommended, which I've mentioned just now, an example, sometimes we forsake what is obligatory. So this is important. This is a very important message that the Prophet Sallallahu is trying to share to us. So that is an extension of what we covered last week. But this week, all right, we were going to talk about the Prophet's Hajj, the Prophet's pilgrimage to perform the, the Hajj. Okay? Yeah, uh, and this was the year where the, the, the deputations have been completed. So some scholars, they, they differ in opinion. Some say that the deputations came before Hajj. Some say it came, it came after Hajj. But from um, one, I'm going to take the opinion that it happened, right? The Hajj happened when the deputations have been completed. At the same time, the divine commandment that makes it incumbent upon Muslims to pay their zakat was also was also revealed on this year, all right, which is the 10th day of Hijrah. So things were done. So the Prophet then performed the Hajj. Now the Hajj was in interesting because the Prophet announced it to everyone that he's performing the Hajj. So the companions went in throngs to join the Prophet. Some narration says it was um, 10,000. Some said it was up to 13,000, 14,000 companions who wanted to follow the Prophet for the Hajj. And the Prophet deliberately announced it. Right? Why did he deliberately announce it? Because he wants it. Because the Hajj, right? The act of the, the, the Hajj was actually performed in by the people, even the people of Jahili, right? The people who were ignorant, the disbelievers last time in Mecca, Abu Jahal and all, they performed the Hajj. In fact, one of those who fought against the Prophet was a man called Al-Walid bin Mughira, who's the father of Khalid bin Walid. He fought opposed against the Prophet. But before the Prophet was before before that. He was known to be the most generous person when it comes to attending to people perform the pilgrimage. However, the act of pilgrimage before the Prophet was before the Nabi Muhammad was revealed as a prophet was one that was filled with practices which were against the teachings of, teachings of Islam. So the Prophet now is trying, is, is calling upon the companions to join for Hajj. And one of the reasons was for him to use this opportunity to show people how Islam and they teach us to perform the Hajj. How Allah wants us to perform the Hajj. To show to people, this is how it's supposed to be done. And this is the trademark of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a pedagogy. To do, to show, to do it, and people will follow you. The Prophet says, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Perform your pray prayers like how, like how you see me perform it. Okay, and we talk about this in, in a few in a few, le a few lessons back when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when after the agreement of Hudaybiyah, when he was supposed to slaughter a sheep and he was supposed to cut his or to shave his hair because he failed to enter and perform Umrah. The companions didn't want to do it because they were still bewildered. They were still, in, they were, they were still shocked by the outcome of the uh, lopsided agreement, supposedly. But the Prophet Sallallahu he, he showed. So he slaughtered an animal and then he shaved his hair and everyone else followed. So the Prophet Sallallahu he likes to lead by example. That's why the scholar says, Lisanul Hal, of sahu milisanil maqal, whatever is said, whatever all actions are more fluent than what is just merely being being said. So that was one reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, wanted to show, wanted to call the companions because he wanted to show to them how Hajj is done according to the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to how Allah wants it to be done. Secondly, the Prophet has very important messages that he's going to share, which we're going to talk about next week. Inshallah, we talk about his sermon at Arafah. So these are the two reasons why he called upon the companions right, to join him for, for Hajj. So there was about 90,000, right, and some people say it was about uh, 13,000, 14,000. They all followed the Prophet Wasallam. Now, another interesting part that we might overlook is the fact that this came right, towards the end of the Prophet's life. 
this came after Prophet Sallallahu after Prophet Sallallahu has fought the battles necessary to bring about stability to the region, especially to Mecca and Medina. He fought against those very people who were threatening the safety, the security of the region. One, it came also, secondly, it came also after he has shown how diplomacy can be done and how he did that war all right, in a diplomatic way to people who came to him, the Bedouin tribes, the leaders, the esteemed leaders from other parts of the Arabian Peninsula. So one aspect was fighting a battle, which was necessary at the point of time. The other aspect was to, to, to engage you know, in a diplomatic manner, to engage with wisdom all right, with the people who came to him. And thirdly, all right, it came also at a, a point of time whereby most matters with regards to the practices of Islam has been revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu and is in fact being practiced by the Prophet Sallallahu and this Hajj was one of those things that were coming in at the end. It is as though, it is as though the Prophet was telling us that in order for us to have a Hajj that is accepted, a Hajj that is meaningful, a Hajj that brings, that is life-changing, is important for us to actually appreciate the holistic nature of Islam itself, to appreciate Islam as a whole. Right? Some people, they go for the Hajj and then they expect to go through a change. They expect to be uplifted without them actually going through the appreciation of this religion prior to going. So without making the necessary preparation. Whereas Hajj in itself, the culmination of the pillars of Islam that came before it. Talking about the Shahada, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. All right, he's talking about the Shahada, and if you perform the Hajj, it is a testimony of the oneness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and you are following the methodology shown by the Prophet Sallallahu So that is a manifestation of the of the Shahada, and then when you perform the Salat, all right, you perform the Salat while when you go for when you when you perform the Salat, the dynamics of the Salat, the Desired outcome of salat is inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. That salat is supposed to prevent us from performing fahsha, from performing things, misdeeds, to, from, from performing munkar, right? From performing things that are disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you go for hajj, Allah says, wala fusuqa wala jidala fil hajj. Right? Do not, do not, wala rafatha, wala fusuqa, wala jidala filhaj. Do not get involved in dirty talk. Do not get involved in, 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 in fusuq, in acts of misdeed, in arguments. And this is an outcome of salat. So salat itself, all right, the lessons from salat becomes an important part of hajj. And then if you're talking about fasting, and fasting is talking about forbearance, it's talking about patience. And this lesson from from the fasting is also very pertinent to the Hajj. You can be performing Hajj. Allah says, Wala jidala fil Hajj. All right? Do not get engaged in arguments when you're performing the Hajj. That calls for patience. Then you're talking about Zakat. Paying off Zakat. What's that got to do with Hajj? The dynamics behind Zakat is for you to look out for people around you, to look out for community, to look out for people who are in need. When you go for Hajj, it's important for you to lower your ego. It's important for you to be selfless. It's important for you to look at people around you and see your fellow Muslim brothers. You see people who are in need in the street sometimes. It's good for you to be generous towards them. And Hajj is not just about you and Allah SWT. It's about you and Allah's creations. And that's how you understand Hajj as a very holistic entity. It is it's as though the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, right, Hajj doesn't start with the journey towards Mecca. In fact, it's like a culmination of all that the Prophet has gone through. Right from the day he was, he was, he was sent forth as a messenger, all the way till this time when he's performing the Hajj, it's as though all those who are actually preparing the Prophet ﷺ for this event called the pilgrimage to, to Mecca to perform the to perform the Hajj. And that's something that we need to bear in mind as well. So our journey, so we hope that the situation will get better, that we can perform the Hajj, we can perform the Umrah, we can perform this, we can visit the Kaaba, we can visit the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. We hope for that day to come. But the preparation starts now. Appreciate the dynamics of Salat. Appreciate the dynamics that come with fasting. We fast. So are we a better person as a result of the fasting? We pray. 
has our pray has our prayer made us a better person not just to Allah Subhanahu ta'ala but also to his creations if we perform the zakat do we look out for people around us on those days on those months where we are not required to pay the zakat so these are things that we need to appreciate when we understand the prophet's pilgrimage we understand how he performed his hajj it was not just a ritual it was not just a process it was a process that was both intrinsic and extrinsic it was inward and outward and a hajj that is accepted by Allah Taala is such so we begin our hajj journey we begin our umrah here set that intention that all that we are doing today is to be translated into a meaningful experience to in in Makkah and in in Medina next week when we catch up with one another we will try to find out what was the message that was relayed by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the companions on the day of of Arafah alhamdulillah hari ini saya berkongsi uh, panjang sikit tentang nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam dan bagaimana bagi nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam ini uh, melaksanakan ibadah haji dan dia ibadah haji ini datang setelah selesai beberapa pertanggungjawab yang Rasulullah SAW melaksanakan. Pertama, ialah Rasulullah SAW telah pun memerangi mereka yang mendatangkan bahaya kepada kestabilan, kepada kehidupan or aman damai di Jazirah Arab itu sendiri iaitu terutama sekali kawasan Mekah dan Madinah. Bagi telah memerangi mereka-mereka yang mendatangkan bahaya. Membasmi bahaya yang datang kepada kestabilan masyarakat-masyarakat yang ada di di sekeliling kota Mekah dan Madinah. Kedua baginda juga pada waktu ini telah menunjukkan kaedah pendekatan yang bukan berperang tapi sebaliknya kaedah berdakwah kepada mereka-mereka diplomat-diplomat orang-orang daripada kawasan luar daripada Mekah dan Madinah yang datang bertemu baginda orang-orang baik raja-raja baik-baik baik menteri baik yang berstatus kenamaan maupun orang-orang Arab Badui baginda menunjukkan kaedah dakwah yang bukan keras yang bukan yang penuh dengan hikmah dan kasih sayang dan ketiganya pula kita melihat bahawasanya Ibadah haji ini datang setelah sempurnanya perintah-perintah agama yang lainnya seperti solat, seperti mana zakat dan juga puasa. Puasa. Setelah sempurna ini maka datanglah pula pelaksanaan ibadah ha, ibadah haji. Nah, di sinilah kita melihat seolah-olah proses ini adalah satu mesej daripada Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kepada kita bahawasanya untuk menghargai proses haji itu dengan benar-benar penghargaan dan bukan suatu perkara yang hanya kita pergi dan kita pulang sebagai orang yang sama adalah dengan kita sendiri bermulakannya proses tersebut di sini di kota Singapura ini kita mengharapkan satu hari nanti kita dapat kembali ke Mekah ke Madinah untuk melaksanakan ibadah umrah dan haji namun sementara menunggu waktu tersebut inilah hari yang paling baik untuk kita memulakan langkah-langkah kita ke sana dengan memperbaiki segala yang kita ada di sini sekarang kita melihat seolah-olah mesej Nabi ialah segala yang kita amalkan sekarang ini sepatutnya tertumpu kepada pelaksanaan haji yang sempurna nanti. Sebagai contoh, kita melihat elemen elemen-elemen rukun Islam itu dia ini tercerna dalam ibadah haji itu sendiri. Syahadah, menaik naik saksi bahawasanya Allah itu sahajalah Tuhan yang layak disembah dan Nabi Muhammad itu pesuruh Allah Subhanahu taala. Nah, kalau kita melaksanakan ibadah haji dan kita membaca talbiyah, kita membaca zikir dan sebagainya adalah satu penyaksian bahawasanya Allah itu adalah yang esa. Dan cara melaksanakan ibadah haji, manasik hajinya itu menurut akan apa yang ditunjukkan oleh Nabi Muhammad SAW. Maka itu adalah manifestasi syahadah. Kemudian kalau kita melaksanakan, kalau kita lihat pada bab solat pula, bila kita melaksanakan ibadah haji, apakah fungsi solat? Mencegah perkara keji dan perkara mungkar. Nah, orang kalau pergi ibadah haji itu Allah mengatakan, wala rafatha wala fusuqa wala jidala fil hajj bagi haji itu tak boleh kata-kata benda kotor benda-benda yang cela tak boleh kita ni membuat perkara yang fasik benda-benda yang maksiat dan tak boleh saling bertengkar nah ini adalah sebuah hasil daripada solat yang sempurna dan haji yang sempurna juga datang dengan kita ini mempunyai solat yang sempurna sebab solat yang sempurna menjadikan kita berakhlak mulia dan orang yang akhlak mulia itulah antara yang mendapat haji yang mabrur dia lihat buat puasa pula. Puasa itu mengajar kita apa? Untuk menahan kehendak kita, keinginan kita dan fokus kepada apa yang Allah hendak daripada kita. Begitu juga haji. Bila kita melaksanakan ibadah haji, kita nak dapat redha Allah. Dan kalau kita nak redha Allah, ada masanya apa yang kita mahu harus diketepikan untuk memberikannya kepada orang lain. Untuk memberikan keutamaan kepada orang lain lebih memerlukan kepada kita. Itu nilai puasa. Zakat begitu juga. 
post proses zakat. Fungsi zakat itu adalah satu proses yang mana melibatkan satu proses yang mana kita melihat orang-orang yang memerlukan dalam masyarakat dan mengutamakan mereka. Haji bukanlah semata-mata kita dengan Allah semata-mata. Tapi melibatkan hubungan kita dengan ciptaannya. Untuk kita bersabar, untuk bersifat ihsan. Ada orang yang memerlukan di tanah suci nanti. Bagaimana kita menanggapi mereka? Ada orang yang perlukan bantuan kita, bimbingan kita. Bagaimana kita menanggapi mereka? Nah, ini semua bermula bukan di Mekah dan di Madinah. Bermula di sini. Kalau kita sudah membiasakan diri kita dalam kehidupan kita untuk memastikan ianya tertumpu kepada hasil-hasil yang dihajatkan daripada ibadah kita, maka bila mana kita pergi haji nanti, insya Allah kita akan mendapati bahawasanya kita dapat merasakan kepuasan, merasakan penghayatan yang luar biasa pada ibadah ibadah haji kita. Nah, itu mungkin mesej yang Nabi nak sampaikan kepada kita. Oleh sebab itu, nak, itu di penghujungnya. Sebab Nabi bila nak pergi haji ini, diumumkan kepada pada semua. Jadi yang ikut, ada di web mengatakan sebanyak 9, 9,000, ada kata sebanyak 10,000, ada yang mengatakan sebanyak 14,000. Ramai yang ikut Nabi SAW kerana Nabi hendak menunjukkan kepada orang ramai cara bagaimana haji itu di, dilaksanakan. Bagaimana ibadah haji itu dilaksanakan, bagaimana yang menjadi satu mengikut yang sepatutnya dilaksanakan. Sebab apa? Sebelum ini pada zaman-zaman jahiliah, orang buat haji juga. Tapi dengan segala-segala kemungkaran, orang bertahu dalam keadaan telanjang. Dan orang menyebutkan kalimah-kalimah yang yang melambangkan kesyirikan dan menduakan Allah SWT, maka Nabi ingin mengajar para sahabat. Nah, kalau nak buat haji, begini caranya. Ya, sebab kemudian Nabi SAW mengatakan, Solu kama ra'aitu muni usolli. Kalau kamu nak solat, tengok bagaimana aku solat. Begitu juga haji, Nabi suka menunjukkan contoh pelaksanaannya. Dan kedua Nabi nak berikan mesej yang penting nanti bila ada di berada di tanah suci terutama sekali pada waktu wukuf dia di Arafah. Ini perkara ini semua akan kami lihat insya-Allah pada minggu hadapan. Tapi yang penting hari ini kita tanam dalam diri kita untuk mula menghayati akan setiap ibad rukun-rukun dalam agama kita. Semoga bila mana kita diundang untuk melaksanakan rukun Islam yang kelima itu semuanya menjadi satu yang mana ia memenuhi dada kita, memenuhi pengalaman kita, pengalaman kita, haji kita, umrah kita, haji dan umrah yang paling bermakna yang pernah kita lalui. Kita berjumpa lagi pada minggu hadapan. Sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Terima kasih.